Hello and welcome to today's session. I'm here in the booth with Zadata and my name is Paul Nashwadi. I'm joined by Eric from Zadata. Eric, would you like to introduce yourself? So nice talking to you here. So my name is Eric Nordmark. I'm a co-founder and CTO at Zadata. And yeah, we say Zadata, but other people say Zadata, that's fine. So um, we used to say as long as they pay us money that you can pronounce it any way they want. Perfect. But, um, so we've been focusing on the edge computing space and what we like to call, you know, the edge is pretty big. It's anything from something that's just outside of the cloud to something that's running on an embedded computer on the factory floor type thing. What we focus on is distri distributed edge. So there's actually th things like IoT gateways, sort of a small form factor industrial PCs to just sort of potentially ruggedized servers that are sitting out on a truck or at a retail location or, or whatever. And in many cases, it's more sort of physically exposed. They might have less network connectivity. And typically, I mean, there's no IT staff there. There might not be any staff at all. It might be sitting out, we have cases out in, in solar farms and wind farms where there's no one around. You need to send somebody there, it will take hours or days before they get there. Right? So, so that's sort of the domain of edge computing that we focus on, and then looking at enabling both running legacy software uh, like virtual machine images and, and containers, Kubernetes, whatever, sort of as part of the evolution. So. Wow, that's a lot to consider when you're thinking about edge computing and you're thinking about what's happening at the edge. And you know, one of the things that really comes up quite often in my, in my interactions with clients and customers is the fact that open source is a challenge, right? And it offers a lot of challenges, but also a lot of gains. So, like the Linux Foundation can offer a lot of advantages to that. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, and it, in terms of what challenges people see, it depends on where they're coming from. So I think that we have some customers that sort of it's the IT department that's coming and they're doing sort of cloud out strategies. So they're already used to running containers, you know, Kubernetes in the data center and they just want to be able to deploy that stuff out at the edge. Um, so they're sort of familiar with this because by and large that all runs on open source, right? You have other customers that the group people we're talking to, they're more coming from the embedded space and they say, we've been doing this embedded computing appliances, now we want to connect it, we want more agility, right? Uh, being able to deploy new things, move towards containers, at AI, whatever. But they say, but wait, we've heard that this, this, this open source thing is not secure, right? Because they maybe heard that from like Microsoft 20 years ago. Uh, but then as Microsoft started using Linux and Azure, it's sort of like they changed their story, but they might not have picked up on that. So, so they're sort of concerned that it's, it might not be as secure, right? It's something that you have to be able to respond to by referring to it has actually changed. If you look today, whether it's open source or closed source, there's plenty of challenges around, you know, how do you keep your software supply chain sort of secure? Because all the software, it's very complex. There's lots of different components, packages, et cetera. And, and you know, the Linux Foundation is spending a lot of time on building the tools for this, as well as encouraging the various projects to use those tools to, to be able to build what's called software bill of materials, or being able to have ways of tracking CVEs against the stuff automatically, figuring out what needs to be updated as part of your project, et cetera. So. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. The, the thing I'm seeing in our research and, in, and customer conversations is uh, many organizations want to work with vendors that have uh, support and open source uh, activities. You had mentioned that it may not be secure, but the other view is it's tested and hardened by the community because yeah. there's a lot of people touching it. So, so I think that there's an interesting perspective there. Yeah, it's also that they can actually take it apart, right? I mean, we have people that do penetration testing, both sort of back black box as well as white box, when they actually look at the source code and say, hey, can we attack this stuff? It looks a bit fishy, right? So open source actually helps with lots of this. Right? makes it easier. Absolutely, and you mentioned the aspects of having S-bombs or soft yeah. materials. That's important too for having the right delivery, uh, especially within the CI-CD pipeline, so that's really a big, a big factor. But speaking of that, when we look at the modernization effort, right? We look at applications and what it means at the edge, just Kubernetes impacts at the edge, and, and Zdata has a lot to offer here, right? There's a lot around containers and how containers may be helping, but also could be hurting environments. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, we, we've sort of, we're on a journey with our customers, right? And just to sort of, the startup experience was, when we started this six years ago, we thought, okay, people are going to deploy things at the edge that's sort of modern, right? They're going to do serverless, they're going to do unikernels, they're going to, you know, do all of these things. And then, as we start talking to the customers, they say, oh no, but we're running your Windows XP, right? So right. how can you help, right? <laughs> 
Um, so, so for the customers, it is sort of that journey that they have something deployed out in the field, often running on Windows, as sort of a standalone appliance, and they say, how can we move the stuff to the future? And they see that it's containers and Kubernetes, you know, that's the future. And then how can you actually guide them on that saying, you know, you can start by deploying this virtual machine, you run Linux with containers next to it, you can now figure out what data you want to expose, how do you actually build the flexibility when you refactor that, when you refactor that you know, monolithic Windows system into separate containers as well. But I, everybody sees that you know, the flexibility that you get with Kubernetes and containers, that's something that they want at the end. Yeah, it's definitely a journey. Um, we see, again, in the conversations, there's, there's that, I, I usually tell the story around past, present, future. Like you have your heritage or past applications that you need to do something with, whether you encapsulate them into a VM or a Kubernetes, or maybe a fat, cluster, a fat container maybe. Um, but, but there's really the impact of modernization and moving to containerization, microservices, and orchestration, right? So along those lines. But there's very specific things that happen at the edge. And when we look at it, how do you think um, you know, Kubernetes, containerization, orchestration, what, how does that all impact in specifically at the edge and what's happening there? Um, so I think that, that people want to leverage these tools so, and, and I think that they see that flexibility and I think they're different levels. So today we have very large deployments where, where people are deploying single node Kubernetes right, out, out at car dealerships to sort of basically have a secure, flexible way of delivering, delivering firmware into EVs, et cetera. And, but, but people also want to say, well, but that's step one on this journey, because then you want to say, okay, now I want to have redundancy, so I want to be able to build a cluster where I can actually get the services to fail over as the hardware dies, et cetera, right? So there, there are these different things where, yes, it's all about leverage. It's all about leverage of the software that's actually been built in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So, and figuring out what do you need to do uniquely for the edge, because this distributed edge is different in a few different ways in terms of you know, security threats and in terms of net, network connectivity. Yeah, I was uh, recently reading some industry research around the fact that over the next uh, three years, we're seeing that organizations are anticipating 500 to 1,000 edge applications at each edge location that's worldwide. So this is just a tremendous amount of growth. And that type of growth with modernization, obviously Kubernetes and containers is a faster way to scale, right? faster way to use it. So what you're talking about in that space is really meeting the client where they are. They may kind of be a little bit slower on their journey, but eventually move towards that rapid deployment. And when we see these other environments that you're talking about. Specifically, you mentioned skill gap issues, you mentioned some other issues that kind of occur at the edge. One of the things that, um, that I think about when I think about the edge and application is some of the unique uh, challenges that happen at the distributed edge, like physical challenges, security issues, you know, even connectivity, like you were mentioning, there's connectivity issues. Can you expand a little bit on, on more how is it data can kind of help with that? Yeah, so, so there's actually, We've, we can start with sort of the software infrastructure. So if you're deploying things in the cloud, there's a bunch of things that the hyperscaler already takes care of for you because you get a VM and you don't actually, the fact that they have a bunch of physical security, they have the ability to update the underlying host software, et cetera, right? There's stuff there that you get for free. And if you're running on a bare metal box sitting out in the field, you don't have that anymore. So you need to think about those things and sort of applying principles like, just like we have immutability with containers and Kubernetes, well you want the, the underlying operating system to be that way as well. Yeah, so that's why we actually started building in the EVOS and contributing that to the Linux Foundation. Um, but then connectivity wise, deployment inside the, the cloud is assuming that, well I can actually go reach out to whether I have 100 different um, nodes in my cluster where they have a hundred different clusters, I can go reach them all the time, right? Uh, or most of the time. What we're seeing out in the field is, well, sure, they're there. There, there are a lot more clusters. There might be 10,000 clusters with one node in them or three nodes in them, but a significant percentage is going to be powered off. Or they're sitting in a shipping container out on the way out to be installed, but they might already be onboarded from a software perspective. So, so you, you sort of have to structure things differently in terms of how you actually go and provision things. So the principles that we have with Kubernetes are great. Sort of eventual consistency and immutability, et cetera, right? Declarative uh, configuration. But the sort of implementation needs to evolve to be able to deal with this sort of, yes, I want to go update this piece of software. I want to go deploy this pod. Okay, it will start when it connects back in, right? Which could be 
in, in a minute, it could be in a week, right? Uh, and then security-wise, in many cases, these things are in exposed locations. Um, or there's enough of them that, and enough value that they realize that, okay, people are going to steal these things. Some people might steal them because they think it's a, it's a computer, right? I can resell it. Some people will steal them because they, the data that's on it, right? And being able to deal with that both from sort of physical security perspectives, when it's different saying I can block access to this, to this server, to this VM running in the cloud, as opposed to, no, someone is actually there, they can unplug the disk, right? They can boot something different, they have access to the BIOS, what, what harm can they do? So sort of building that underlying infrastructure is a key enabler for this, so you can now actually take, once you have that in place, now you can take both your legacy VMs as well as your containers and your Kubernetes workloads and you can say, I have a, a substrate to run the stuff on that is, is sort of robust enough and, and trustworthy enough that it makes sense. I like where you were going with that because when I think about that modernization journey and you think about the adoption of containers, what we're seeing in industry research is portability of applications is critical. Actually, 20% of respondents of a 400 person survey indicated that Portability was critical, right? They see that 67% of those respondents said it was very important to them. So to be able to move that application from, from core to edge to cloud and et cetera yeah. is incredibly important. And that's where I think Zadata has a, a leg yeah. up there as well. And it's all about them sort of being able to optimize things. They can test them in the cloud. When they get more data coming in, and they can say, okay, can I run the same thing out at the edge? Okay, right. right. Right, no, that's, that's great. And so on our, on our last kind of topic, and, and I would be kind of amiss if I didn't talk about it, we have to talk about AI, because AI is a big factor, in, yep. and that's, everybody's talking about it. Uh, we're seeing it everywhere here at the show here. But um, you know, when we look at AI-enabled applications, what's different in, from a Zadata perspective that helps AI at the edge and those applications at the edge? So, so one thing that's, you know, people will actually be running AI in different forms. They've been running with GPUs. You have customers that have been running with GPUs sort of doing more traditional analytics out in the field. And, and they will end up doing more and more of this stuff. I think the way people are, are talking about this today is you would actually train things on a data set sort of in some more controlled environment and then actually do the inferencing out at the edge. Um, and then over time sort of figure out what does it mean in terms of the feedback loop, in terms of getting retraining in place. I've been talking to people here during the show and you know, most people worry about the day one problem. How can I get it from the developer into deployment, right? But then sort of the retraining part and all of the stuff, that will be sort of next year or the year after. But, but, it, but it's moving, moving very quickly. But, but I think the, the other part of this is deploying this stuff at thousands of locations, right? You know, you want to make it be as automatically deployable as possible. So you drop ship out hardware, somebody plugs it in, and it's securely onboarded. And then one of the things that we bring is the ability to specify policy so that when this device actually shows up and connects up to, to, to Sedita, the rules are already there saying you should actually deploy these things, right? You should run with these policies, et cetera. So it, it auto deploys there, you know, downloads whatever it needs, and then, then you're up and running. So very much ease of use. That's yes. what it sounds like to me. Yeah. I mean, it's all about that because you want it to be robust, you want it to be secure, right? But it needs to be easy to use because you want to crank these things out. The local installer is an electrician, right? It's not an IT person, right? So. Yeah. Well, Eric, as we, as we wrap up our session today, would you like to leave the audience with some parting words of where, you, where they can go to get started with you? Yeah, so if you want to find out more about Sedita, you can go look at our website. If you're interested in the open source side of things, there's also LF Edge. Um, you know, so under github.com, LF Edge Eve, this is Project Eve. So this is all open source Edge operating system. So please go and check that stuff out and you know, please join the community. So we're trying to build this stuff for the next generation. So. Eric, I'd like to thank you for your perspective and your insights today. It's been really wonderful having you on today's show. And I'd like to thank the audience for attending today's session. For more information, please go to futurimgroup.com.